Okay, sorry about that. My computer froze again, and we were right on chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So, um, the keys to remember here is the chronic. When you look at the symptoms, the symptoms creep up slow, very insidiously. And I keep saying this over again because they're really the traits and the main characteristics of the disease that I'm trying to push on. You'll notice I tell you over and over and over again. Not just because I want you to memorize it, but because I want it to stick in your head so that when you start thinking about leukemias, well, what separates acute from chronic? What separates the myelocytic from the, uh, the lymphocytic? So what are the main characteristics? And with the chronics, again, they creep up slowly, they ins they're insidiously. They have a lot of the same characteristics that you see with acute leukemias. They just are more drawn out. So the problem with this is that you know a lot of people think, well, I've had a rough year, my job's been a little bit tougher. Whatever problems that they're having, um, they just they accredit it to other things that aren't the actual leukemia. So the key is, again, you want to remember is this is lymphocytic. It's the lymphocytes that are doing it. And just like acute lymphocytic, they like to invade tissues, like to get into the tissues and cause damage. They like to gunk up things. So they go and hide out at the spleen, the bone marrow, the lymph nodes. They try and move into all these tissues and they cause them to get inflamed. They cause swelling. They cause damage. They're filling it up with immature lymphocytes that don't know what they're doing. They're just going in and gunking up the place. So a lot of the symptoms you see uh, lymph node pathology, splenomegaly, hematomegaly, problems like that. You see overproduction of chemicals that cause symptoms like fever. Right? Another big thing about the chronic forms is that most cases of chronic leukemia are actually discovered through routine blood exams. They went in for a regular checkup, the doctor looks at the blood, sends it off to the lab, and then analyze it and they say, oh my gosh, you know, look at this white blood cell count. And then they come in and they start doing more inspections. They'll take a bone biopsy and they'll look at the tissue there too. So these are usually hidden. Who knows really the number of people that, that are out there with different forms of uh, chronic leukemias and don't even know about it yet. So the key points here with CLL is that it's slow progressing. Okay? It shows as immature lymphocytes more common in older, older patients. It, when we do a treatment, it's not curative. It's just slowing the symptoms or delaying the problem. So the CLL is actually the most common type of leukemia in the Western world, and it primarily affects patients that are over 70 years of age in 75% of the, the cases. So it can happen a little bit younger, but the bulk of the cases are over 55, and 75% are actually over the age of 70. All right, so chronic myositic leukemia. In this situation, most of these leukemias, remember, are idiopathic. They know there's some kind of genetic link, but this one, 95% of the cases are actually due to translocation. Whoops, typo. I should have an R in there. Translocation between chromosome 9 and chromosome 22, and they call that the Philadelphia translocation. Jeez, two typos in the same sentence. All right, so anyway, we know that there's some kind of a, a, a link. And remember, when you have a translocation, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily passed on from parent to child. It could be something that happens to the sperm cell. It could be something that happens to the uh, um, like egg that wasn't directly because of mom and dad's genes, but something happened, like a mutation happened or a flaw happened to the, uh, the um, sperm or the egg. Right? When you look at this, this actually has three phases. So at first it has the chronic phase, and the chronic phase can last for years. And this is where people are basically indolent. And indolent, a big fancy word for saying they feel lazy, they avoid activity, and I know I've, I've had some plenty of days lately that I feel indolent, so maybe I should go get checked out, right? Eh, I'm not such a hypochondriac anymore. But anyway, they, they just feel tired, they feel worn out, like I was saying. They try to blame other things, like it's their job, you know, their life's been really, really stressful and really crazy, and they just feel worn out all the time. Maybe they don't play sports like they used to, they give up a lot of their activity, right? Then comes a short accelerated phase, and this can last for six to 12 months. And this accelerated phase is where they'll get worsening anemia. They'll actually get this progressive thrombocytopenia where, the, where the, uh, they're not making enough thrombocytes. Splenomegaly gets worse. So basically, it's, it, it almost looks like it's shifting into an acute phase. Right? So they start cranking up things like basophils, their bone marrow blasts start cranking up. They start getting all these these symptoms really piling on. And then the last phase, the terminal blast crisis can last to three months and this is where basically the accumulation of these blast cells are all over the extramedullary sites. And when I say extramedullary, I'm talking about outside of the, the medulla of the bone, the bone marrow. 
So they start having these infiltrates that are moving into all of their tissues like lymph nodes and skin. And this makes it look more like a lymphocytic leukemia. So you don't see so much of that problem in the early stages, but at the very end, they're just making so many white blood cells, it's basically like they're just getting crammed in to all these other structures, the all, all these other organs. So kind of the key points here is that it's because of a translocation. They call it the Philadelphia translocation, or some, sometimes they call it the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, when they take a peripheral smear, usually it's, well, I don't know why I say usually, it's going to be myelocytic cells like basophils or eosinophils, but they're immature. So what were the basophils and eosinophils? Were they agranulocytes or granulocytes? They're granulocytes. So they have really distinguished characteristics. They actually make a lot of this chemical called tyrosine kinase, which I'm not going to go into the biochemistry with you because you don't need to know it, but a lot of the treatments focus on on blocking this chemical tyrosine kinase. And it's not a cure, but what it does is it prolongs their life. So chemotherapy usually is effective more in the blast stage, stage the uh, terminal blast phase, that last one. All right, so homework number nine. What are the primary age groups and distinguishing characteristics of CML compared to CLL? Wow, what's happening to my typos here? Look at that word groups. So I'm totally missing the L. Last couple disorders, so multiple myeloma, and my, multiple myeloma is cancer of the plasma cells. What is a plasma cell? Well, a plasma cell is a mature B cell. So here's a normal B cell. You can see it making antibodies that attack the infective agent, help destroy that infective agent. But something happened where a mutation caused these antibodies to go awry, so you get these long chains of proteins they call M proteins. It's almost like they're making the antibodies, but they're stuck together. So they just hang or dangle along almost like a piece of rosemary there or something. But these plasma cells, they're ineffective now. They usually start causing these osteolytic bone lesions. They start helping, or I hate saying the word helping, but they start increasing the breakdown of bones. And if these chains break free, they go floating through the system, the kidney's gonna try and clear these little antibodies, and then you have to go back to that whole glomerulonephritic uh, symptoms. So you've got this swollen glomerulus destruction to the kidneys and just causes basically this whole chain reaction of bad news. So you can go back and look. Look at glomerulonephritis and see what happens when you start clogging it up with, with antibodies. All right. So how they fix it, usually they replace the bone marrow, they stimulate osteoclasts um, to try and clean things up and, and help process the bone so that it helps repair fat a little bit faster. They have a higher risk of fractures, higher risk of hypercalcemia, um, and then the chemotherapy, with chemotherapeutic agents, they can do that to try and slow the growth or uh, do a transplant too. And then lymphomas. So lymphomas are a solid mass tumor because what's happening is they go to the lymph tissue and then they create this solid tumor. So you see this bulging or swelling at the actual um, node itself. There are two main types and there's Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. Basically, if it doesn't fall into Hodgkin's, it's gotta be non-Hodgkin's. And here you can see the actual tumor. This is actually um, a, a sclerosing Hodgkin's lymphoma that has all this clear tissue. You can see the swelling in the neck. You can see some of the common sites of the swelling under the armpits or axillary areas, down the groin and also in the neck. And then what they do usually is they'll take a little biopsy. They'll make a slice, they'll go down and take a piece of the tissue out and look at it. So let's talk about Hodgkin's first. Hodgkin's is about one in every 200 cases um, are gonna be Hodgkin's. It's a lot less common than non-Hodgkin's, basically because it's very specific. The characteristic that makes Hodgkin's specific is that Hodgkin's has this little thing called Reed-Sternberg bodies. So they have these little structures inside the cell that are basically lots of fragments of nucleus. So the nucleus is mutated and you've got lots of these little structures that die really dark, called Reed-Sternberg bodies. Uh, one of the problems is Reed Sternberg bodies, they're proteins, so when they start going out into the system, they'll stick and they'll block into the kidney, and they can actually cause kidney issues too. All right, it's clinical manifestations. They get the swelling of the lymph nodes, but what makes it interesting is their painless swelling. So they just keep growing and growing. It's basically a firm lump in the lymph node, but there's no pain associated with it, which is really unique. Uh, and here are some pictures of people that have had them. I'm trying to remember, there's a museum that has these pictures. Uh, I think it's called the Mueller Museum in Pennsylvania, I believe. But they have all of these unique cases that they didn't know what they were back in the early turn of the century. And so they would make cast mold or take pictures of them 
and then they have that like for permanent record. All right. So asymptomatic mass, painless. They get a lot of fevers and night sweats. Same thing. You have lots of white blood cells that are releasing lots of uh, agents that are pyrogens and make you sweat a lot. They turn up your metabolism too. Remember, so you go into this hypermetabolic state where you may start losing some weight, getting a little bit thinner, which sounds like a good thing, but the fact that you have this, well, it's a malignant cancer that's growing inside of you, it's kind of bad news. And then one of the other risks is obstructions. Think about this. If this is growing in the neck, what could it do to the esophagus, right? Dysphagia. It's going to make it so that they don't swallow so well. What's it going to potentially do to the airway? It could constrict it, right? What could it do to the carotids? It could block up flow to the brain. So you have to worry about situations like that. And then non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So very, sim very similar. Um, some of the causes have actually been linked to Helicobacter pylori. Some of the causes have been linked to Epstein-Barr virus. Um, in this situation, these are more commonly a painful growth or abnormal growth. So basically, if it's not Hodgkin's, then it's non-Hodgkin's. And remember, Hodgkin's has the Reed Sternberg body. So if you take a sample, you pull out these cells, and you look at them, and they don't have Reed Sternberg, boom, it's non-Hodgkin's is a simple way to think about it. All right? Usually, this will affect just the lymph nodes. If it spreads beyond lymph nodes, then it's bad news. But as long as it's in the lymph nodes, there's a pretty good survival rate because they can actually just take the lymph node out and then take a little extra tissue around it to make sure it hasn't spread. And then the last piece of homework, hemophilia A and von Wildebrand's disease. You've actually looked these up before when we talked about genetics. Um, and when we, then again, when we talk about inflammation and immunity. So hemophilia A, I had to look up because, well, actually, you're going to look it up again. So if you don't remember, what's the cause of it? I kind of gave it away. When I talked about genetics, it, it should have given away what the cause of one of these is. And then what are the common symptoms? Explain why they get those symptoms. So it's hemophilia. What are the symptoms? What's causing those symptoms? And then is there a cure for these two things? And that's the last of this, this section.